This is Delphi Economic Forum. Uh, we are talking about power issues in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Uh, uh, our today's guest is uh, uh, Natalie Tocci from Istituto di Affari Internazionali. Uh, greetings, Ms. Tocci. Thank you for being here with Lovely us. Lovely being with you. Thank you. Uh, I'll go uh, directly into the, to the point. I think that uh, you have the experience and uh, uh, the ability to explain a little bit why uh, you know, people is that are uh, following uh, geopolitics in the, the broader region of the uh, European Union circumference, in, if I may say, uh, do not understand why European Union is not really active uh, like other players. We talk about US policy in the region, we talk about Russian policy in the region, other players in the region, individual countries such as Italy, Spain, Greece, you name it. But uh, we never, we, we always fail to see what's the, the bigger picture there and why EU looks like it is really absent. Yes, I mean, I think, you know, in order to understand it, we have to uh, sort of understand what our point of comparison is. And the truth is that I think the, que the first question to ask ourselves is, uh, was the European Union as such ever particularly active in the region? And the truth is that um, if by active we uh, think of active in sort of more, if you like, traditional power terms, uh, the answer to that question is it never really was. And, and then the next question that we ask ourselves is, so why is it we pay attention to this now more than in the past? And the answer to that question is actually not really found in the European Union, uh, tends to be more found uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. And what I mean by this is that whereas uh, once upon a time we lived in a so-called international liberal order in which the power, the hegemony, if you like, of the United States was dominant, particularly in hard power terms. And within that context, the European Union acted uh, through its different soft policies, uh, the enlargement policy, the neighborhood policy, its development and trade policies, as well as obviously its security policies, but in a sense security policies that are still relatively soft, if you see what I mean. Um, within that context, the, uh, the, the type of role that the European Union played uh, did not really jar, if you like, with, with the reality, where the hard power was dominated very much by the United States. That's changing. That world is changing and we see a United States which is obviously continues to be uh, a superpower in the world but when it comes to our region, our Mediterranean region, uh, tends to take more of a step uh, back. And what has happened is that by taking a step back, it is a step that others have filled. We see that Russia has filled it. We see that Turkey has filled it. We see that the UAE, that Egypt, that various regional powers have filled, as well as some member states, as you rightly point out, but to a lesser extent. And so the absence of the European Union, which is not, it's not as if the European Union has now does things that, or has stopped doing things that it used to do in the past, is that what it does not do is far more visible today than it was in previous decades. So in terms of, uh, you already mentioned a few players, I would like to stay, you know, in the eastern part of the uh, Mediterranean, mostly, you know, Turkey, Egypt, which are the big, uh, the major powers outside of the European Union. And uh, we have seen that uh, Turkey has tried to, has tried to, let's say, uh, force its presence in a few areas like such as Libya, such as northern Syria, Iraq, uh, the proxy war, if, if I may say, in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. And uh, sometimes, Europe, sometimes European Union is a little bit ambiguous on what to do with Turkey. There are member states that are calling for, uh, for a more, uh, if I may say, uh, tough posture. There are other member states that are willing to, you know, continue discussing until uh, uh, we find, we come up with, uh, with a solution, whatever that solution may be. Uh, but in the end of the day, it seems like, you know, Turkey is promoting its agenda and either we fail to see if there is an end game in all that, uh, or we are just, or European Union is just inconclusive of what to do with Turkey because of the member, uh, uh, the... Uh, because, you know, at some point, uh, Europe, uh, Turkey has uh, even uh, wanted to become an EU member, even uh, if, in, uh, if, as you said, I, th I think in previous interviews of yours, that it's a little bit uh, 
uh, unrealistic to expect that at some point uh, uh, Turkey is going to to become a, a new uh, member state. So, uh, where do we go from now on with uh, with Turkey? Hmm. Well, that's that's a million dollar question. I would uh, respond in, in in two ways, uh, and and I say so with, if you like, um, all, all the pragmatism, if you like, uh, that that I'm capable of. I think that when we look at Turkey, first we have to be very clear-eyed about what is it that Turkey does which uh, really contravenes our interests and what does not. Foreign policy-wise, I think domestic policy-wise, we can probably all agree that it's, kind of, you know, an authoritarian trend. It's difficult to see anything particularly positive. But foreign policy-wise, which are the flashpoints where we really do have an issue? And I would say that, you know, well, certainly there's been the question of the Eastern Mediterranean. I would say to an extent, uh, but we need to disentangle this, there is the question of the Caucasus. I say we need to disentangle it because it's not as if the European Union has ever stood against the territorial integrity of Azerbaijan. So it's more about the way in which it is done rather than the objective, if you like, which is pursued. So I think we need to differentiate it. I think in the case of Libya, again, it's more of a question of the means employed rather than the objective pursued, given that we have all been in favor of, well, once upon a time, the government of national accord uh, and now the national uh, unity government. But it's more the means that are pursued. So I think it's important to differentiate, you know, where is it that we really do have a problem with Turkey? Where is it that we don't? Where we do have a problem with Turkey, and that's my second reflection, and, and therefore we would like Turkey to change behavior, I think the question that as Europeans we need to ask ourselves is, what is the most effective way of doing that? I mean, beyond this kind of, you know, feeling good with ourselves by uh, finger pointing and telling people off and telling them what they, you know, we don't like uh, to see happen. If we really are interested in changing behavior, what is the most effective way of doing it? when it comes to Turkey. Now, one extreme is going for really, really, you know, going for the stick, but doing so in a really meaningful way. Can we imagine that as Europeans uh, and willing to go down that path? My answer to that question is no. Uh, I think that, yes, we're willing to consider and we have been willing to consider and to pursue soft sanctions. Mm. But these are not sanctions that change behavior. And I think we should all be cognizant of it. So to me, the, the alternative answer is that of saying, how do we channel the relationship, the EU-Turkey relationship, back into a rules-based framework, which is one uh, which is not therefore purely transactional, like the EU-Turkey migration statement, uh, where the real bargaining power is in Turkey's hands rather than the, in the EU's hands, how to re-channel the relationship back rules. You said, uh, you know, unfortunately, the accession process is not really uh, a realistic option at the moment, which is why I personally am strongly in favor uh, of opening negotiations on a modernized customs union, because there it is the EU rather than Turkey that has a far stronger bargaining hand, first point. And second point, it is a rules-based framework that and therefore enables us to exert influence uh, on various things, largely to do obviously with domestic uh, politics and the economy, then re-establish a more functioning relationship with Turkey that can then also have an impact on foreign policy. Uh, on your uh, first comment, I would like to say just that in terms of Libya, uh, you has a stake, I believe, because of the Turkish-Libyan memorandum, you know, the maritime zones, the, the limitation part that actually infringes upon uh, Greece's uh, maritime zone rights. Uh, so this is one point on if the EU can, you know, put some more leverage on that. And uh, on the issues of uh, customs union and the, the, migra the, the new state, the, the new agreement on migration that would... Uh, um, uh, being in the place of uh, the 2016 uh, EU uh, Turkey statement. If you think that there is a timetable for that, if we are maybe close to some kind of a migration agreement at some point, uh, in mm. within the year probably, or later. 
Yeah, I mean, just a brief comment on the first point and then to the second. On the first, I would say, yes, I absolutely agree. But again, this is an agreement that was signed uh, by a government uh, in Libya that had very strong interests in uh, reaching an agreement in Turkey. Why did it have strong interests in reaching an agreement with Turkey? Because Turkey saved its back. I mean, you know, to put it in as crude as possible uh, a way. So I think the question that we need to ask ourselves as Europeans is, how do we make ourselves as Europeans indispensable in Libya? And unfortunately, I have to admit that we're not doing very much <laughs> uh, because at the end of the day, it, it is also about hard power. It is about making yourself indispensable. And then you can exert leverage and Turkey has exerted it. You know, I, you know, one cannot blame a country for pursuing what its understanding of its interests is. One can say, well, I disagree with it and I pursue mine. But if we're unable to, you, to, to, to basically defend our own interests, I would say it's more our problem if, in many respects than, uh, than Turkey's. On the, on the second point on, on migration, I think that at the end of the day, uh, the quote unquote uh, social contract uh, remains remains there. Turkey has an interest in EU funds. Uh, the EU has uh, an interest in, in containing migration flows. And this makes me think that, uh, yes, probably an agreement is not uh, too far away. Do I, Natalie, feel comfortable with this? I feel extremely uncomfortable uh, with a situation in which the only quote unquote contract which exists with Turkey is transactional in that way. Uh, I would feel far more comfortable. I'm not saying one doesn't have to uh, reach an agreement on migration. Huh? Don't, don't get me wrong. But I would feel far more comfortable in a situation in which the overall relationship uh, is uh, channeled back into a rules-based framework. And then you can have your deals on security and on migration and on everything else. But I feel very uncomfortable in this very crude dot des uh, relationship on migration when there's nothing else basically going on. Okay, uh, I will ask for a last comment of yours. Again, it's going to be European centered. I wanted to ask you if you believe that uh, uh, probably after that circle of elections that uh, we're going to have in the European Union in the major countries in the uh, following months. Uh, Germany mostly, uh, if you believe that there may have been a time for uh, reconciling interest between the North and the South uh, in terms of uh, at, some, at some point uh, manufacturing, if I may say, some kind of a common foreign policy, if that ever can be the case. Well, look, I think, you know, sort of, uh, I'm going to say something that is going to sound a little bit strange. I think 2020 was, in many respects, a good year for the European Union. Mm? Uh, sounds strange because obviously, <laughs> you know, we've all gone through the sort of, you know, deepest crisis uh, in our lifetimes. Um, but I think it has been a crisis which, after the Eurozone crisis and after the so-called migration crisis, reignited the little magic word, word which is at the heart of the European project, which is solidarity. Uh, and I think that we've seen it through Next Generation EU. I think that, you know, we, we have seen the set of to rise to the challenge together and we can only exit the crisis together. Now, the point is, and, 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 and this is also played out uh, on climate and on digital, I would say. Where I think that there's still a very long way to go is translating, if you like, the third, if you like, mission of this commission, which was that of being a geopolitical commission. Uh, I think that that sense of solidarity, of purposefulness, of acting together uh, has to translate in foreign policy as well. The fact that there is a greater internal unity on internal questions creates, if you like, a more fertile ground. But we have to make sure that we don't just simply kind of look, you know, sort of gaze at our navel and look inside, but that that sense of unity is also uh, transposed externally as well. Thank you for being with us, Ms. Tochi. Thank you.